Super. Great. Here we go. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Well, thank you. It is a beautiful <laughs> afternoon. You wouldn't know it given the fact that we've covered up all the windows yeah. to make sure we don't distract your attention with the beautiful weather. Uh, I'm Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute. For those of you who don't know me, I'm delighted to welcome you to, you to this uh, conversation with Gene Case. Uh, Gene Case is no stranger to most people involved in philanthropy today. You're going to get to know her a lot better in the next few minutes. Uh, this is the third in our occasional series on philanthropic freedom here at AEI. We believe, as, so, as you do if you're here in this audience, that philanthropy is a fundamental part of America's culture. It is important for the United States economy. It's truly something that makes us exceptional. And our guest today is somebody who's making that so now and for future generations. Jean Case is uh, an active philanthropist. She's an investor and a pioneer in the world of IT. Her career in the private sector spanned nearly two decades before she and her husband, Steve Case, created the Case Foundation in 1997, going on 20 years That's right. in philanthropy. Before co-founding the foundation, she was a senior executive at AOL, also worked at GE. Uh, and since moving to full-time philanthropy, she was named by President George W. Bush to chair the President's Council on Service and Civic Participation. Uh, Jean and I met for the first time in that capacity when I was still a professor at Syracuse University. Uh, I was invited to address the president at the Roosevelt Room in the White House, and Jean was there. Um, I didn't know the president. She clearly did. And the big takeaway for me from that meeting, because it's largely a blur, <laughs> I was nervous, <clears throat> was when the president figured out that I had been a f former musician and now an economist, he said, I'm going to call you Weird Dude. <laughs> It's so George Bush. It so is, and that was literally was the only thing about me from that meeting that made the paper. Uh, Jean and Steve Case are signatories of the Giving Pledge, and she often appears on the lists of America's top philanthropist and certainly the most innovative philanthropist in America. Welcome, Jean Case. Wow, what a very nice introduction. <laughs> It is my joy to be with you, Arthur. As you know, I'm a big fan of your work. We thank AEI and you for your leadership around philanthropy, but more broadly, just about putting the themes out there that we all need to be thinking about, focused on, and kind of worried about a little bit. That's, so thanks. Thank Great you. It's, uh, it, we've been watching and admiring your work uh, here in Washington, D.C., and around the country, and indeed around the world. And I think the first question as we talk about philanthropy and your philosophy and what you've been doing for nearly 20 years, You've been doing it for longer than most people, particularly of the tech generation of entrepreneurs, has been thinking about philanthropy. Uh, how did you get interested in the topic and how did it form the way that you see it? I would love to hear your background. Sure, sure. So um, I was raised by a single mom and she raised four kids alone. And so I was an early recipient of philanthropy and in fact benefited greatly from the generosity of other people, both through their time and through their money, to give me opportunities very early in life. And so, you know, as I reflect back on, because this is a question I'm often asked, you know, there's just no question in my mind that if I had an opportunity at some point in life to pay it back and indeed pay it forward, I knew I would want to do that. Where did you grow up? Um, I grew up, in, um, first 11 years spent in Illinois with a cornfield in my backyard. Nice. <laughs> and then uh, my family moved to South Florida. And I lived in South Florida till I came to D.C. 33 years ago. So. And you went to college? I did. I, in high school, one of the sort of areas of generosity that I like to talk about, um, I was on full scholarship at a private school. And because of that, I got connected to some pretty extraordinary people. I really felt like... I was under people's wings, um, and I was really grateful for it because I would come home every day to a house where I was alone. My mom was a waitress. I would come home from school. She would go to work. If we went grocery shopping, the groceries were typically relying on whatever tips were made the day before. So I had this wonderful community of support that just came around me when I was young um, and provided opportunities, and there was a mentor. I thought I was going to be a lawyer. Um, and so there was a mentor that they sort of connected me to so I could intern in his office. And he was first a judge, then he was mayor, and then he became a congressman. 
Um, and so I did go to college, but as I came out of high school, he said, how about, you know, he was getting elected to Congress, he said, how about you stay and work for me? And so I worked for him by day and I went to school by night. Mm. So. Did you grow up in a religious home? Um, my family background was Catholic, but I converted to Protest Protestantism when I was hmm, early teens. Early teens, that's yes. precocious. Yes, it was precocious. You're forging your own direction. That's right, that's right. And uh, so, and in the church that you converted to, was there a, a strong tradition of giving that, that rubbed off was on you? Definitely there was, and, and some of that was some of what I benefited from, from being a part of that church community that supported me. Hmm. Did you break your mother's heart when you converted? No, I really didn't. I think she was really grateful that there was a community that was sort of an extension of the home in the sense, you know, they really were watching after me and taking care of me. And as I said, really providing extraordinary opportunities that I otherwise would have never had the benefit of knowing. Mm. When you got out into the workforce, tell me about your earliest giving experiences. Sure. Well, I have to tell you, I think because of the way that I was raised, I had, you know, a front row seat to what does it mean to have opportunity? And I saw it from both sides, right? The world I lived in at the private school, and then, you know, as I worked for the congressman, was a world of powerful, prestigious people with a lot of access to resources and opportunity themselves. The world I'd grown up in was the opposite of that. People who really didn't have an opportunity to have a great education, know who to call if you needed something, even in some cases pathways to great jobs. Um, I often say that I think the first professional office I ever was in was, you know, the internship office in high school. And, you know, I could have seen myself on a track where perhaps, and it's hard to think about it, sitting in a prestigious room in Washington, D.C., but I'm sure if we look out the window, there are many young people who've never been in a professional office. They don't even understand that there are roles that play out in the professional office. So this idea of giving people opportunity and sort of democratizing access to opportunity, I think animated me from my earliest years. And this comes back to your question. It's actually what led me into technology. I worked for the world's first online service, which was here in DC. It was called The Source. Most of you have probably never heard of it. Um, and that was two online services before I landed at this company that was to be AOL. Um, and really what I saw was an unbelievable opportunity to democratize access to ideas, to information, to communication. It was sort of an opportunity to level the playing field a little bit. So you might imagine with the background that I had, I was super animated by that. And so that wasn't specifically philanthropy, but those feelings of democratizing access to opportunity, I think still plays out very strongly in the way we go forward with philanthropy mm. today. So fast forward to, you know, through a lot of years of economic change and a lot of success and yeah. very, very good things, that certainly through AOL and, and your life and right. Steve's life. Um, tell me about the early days of the foundation, what you were thinking about, how you started it, why you started it, and what did you give to? Sure. So the early days of the Case Foundation actually have their roots in the AOL Foundation because as part of my role at AOL, we, uh, it was my job to basically build the AOL Foundation. It hadn't, obviously, it hadn't existed in our earliest days, and it, it came a little bit later in the company's life that we formed it. So that was a terrific toe in the water for me. I could see sort of what was this philanthropy thing all about, what were the challenges, what were the opportunities. But what we had faced at AOL from a corporate side was what I called death by a thousand cuts. You know, every day, letters, calls, could you, we have this school in Poughkeepsie, oh, could you send a computer to this community center in Waco? I mean, you know, and there was just no way we could deal with the sea of requests coming our way. So it became very clear that we had to sort of pull back and be in control and sort of decide for ourselves what were going to be some of the things we were really wanting to do in a perfect world and then organize our efforts under that. So that was a terrific opportunity for me to see that before we formed the Case Foundation. But I must tell you, it took me quite a while to figure it out as we started the Case Foundation. I'd come out of the private sector, come out of technology, its own kind of culture and world a little bit, and certainly even more so back then before. I mean, we like to say when um, we started AOL, only 3% of the nation were online, 
and they were online one hour a week. Okay, so a very, very different world then. Wow. Yeah, yeah. But when we formed the Case Foundation, which is after I left the company, um, we sort of suffered the same thing. We, we suffered the death by a thousand cuts. We were overwhelmed instantly with people reaching out from all over the nation with really great causes and needs. But it was just like, whoa, we had hit like a windstorm. So we had to do the same thing for our family foundation that we had done at the AOL Foundation. And that was sort of get a grip, decide to be strategic instead of reactive, decide what we were going to be about. And then that really both empowered and made us more comfortable with when we had to say no, right? Because we had a frame through which we were assessing the decision making. So it wasn't just a question of the meritoriousness of the cause. Correct. It had to do with the interest and the impact that you were going to try to have proactively. Absolutely, absolutely. And so for us, it became, I mean, the, the earliest, very large initiative we undertook um, really reflected what has been some sort of cornerstones of how we've gone forward in philanthropy. Um, it was a digital divide initiative. At the time, there was a great concern about the divide in the nation around access to technology. Um, so we worked collaboratively with a number of other leaders, uh, Gateway Computers, Microsoft, um, Hewlett Packard, Cisco, a lot of names um, that you still know today. And together we agreed, and a lot of great individuals came on that board as well, Colin Powell and others. Um, and we put a thousand after school technology centers in low income neighborhoods around the United States. So it was a terrific way really to be able to build a really, really broad tent with a really, really big idea. And the reason it was achievable is because it was a collaboration of a lot of great leaders organizationally, leaders individually, who locked arms. And so for all of us, it wasn't that heavy a lift because many of us were lifting together. I think an important point that's worth emphasizing just as we pause for a second is this is a common theme that we find with, with visionary philanthropists is understanding the good that comes from the free enterprise economy and being able to amplify it through philanthropy. So note that at this time, early on, only 3% of the country is online. <clears throat> the average time online is an hour a day. This is expanding really quickly. But there was, in fact, a digital divide at that point. Very serious. So, so, the point, so AOL is doing good things in, in expanding the information that's available to people. It's democratizing the American economy, potentially. Mm -hmm. Or it could simply increase the income gap that was of significant uh, uh, preoccupation to a lot of people. So therefore, the good that AOL can do can have the accelerant of what the Case Foundation could do to bring it to more people, which is an interesting public-private model and a visionary way of work looking at philanthropy. Right, and you mentioned where we first met, with, which was when I was chairing the President's Council. This sort of cross, we call it cross-sector approaches or public-private um, you know, partnerships, we think they're really under-celebrated and perhaps not well understood in terms of really the exponential power that is brought together when you have what we call all oars in the water rowing in the same direction. And even colleagues in philanthropy that we sit with too often are hesitant to engage the public sector in a meaningful way. At the Case Foundation, we won't invest in an initiative unless it has a public sector partner, a private sector partner, and of course an NGO. And we hope another philanthropy with us as well. Um, but spending time with the corporate sector, spending time with the public sector is something I spend a lot of my time doing. And it just lifts and elevates dramatically the potential for impact. Hmm. So as a specific application, uh, sent, making sure that more people had access to the internet or to technology, but more broadly, philanthropy pushing free enterprise down through the economic spectrum such that it is free, free enterprise itself is more democratized was something you were deeply dedicated to. What are the pillars of your foundation giving today? Sure. So sort of our broad mission is we invest in people and ideas that can change the world. And so when I tell people that, they go, that's nice. What do you do? <laughs> mm. So we've tried to organize our work a little bit in what we call three buckets. One is revolutionizing philanthropy. And I think we're going to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about some of our efforts there. Very exciting work. Um, unleashing entrepreneurship. And we mean unle unleashing across all those sectors that I just talked about. 
And the third, again, not surprisingly based on what you've heard already, igniting civic engagement. Really an opportunity to ask every citizen to come in and play a role. Um, we believe passionately that people actually have good hearts and good intentions, but it's actually really hard work to move people from good intentions to action. And so in those sort of three buckets, we really are uh, feverishly focused on that. Hmm. Um, and those can encompass a lot of different things, and we're going to get into yeah. some specifics in a second. So the, the next question is, in revolutionizing philanthropy, unleashing entrepreneurship, and igniting civic engagement, how do you decide what you're going to do and who's going to do it? So take me through sure. a day in your life, and you're going to get a lot right. of people who think that they can do one or more of those things. Right. How do you decide? Well, first of all, it kind of goes back to what I said about when we got the foundation started. We really had to have an understanding of how do we think we can uniquely add value? And it took us about five years to figure that out, but that sort of is the first question that we'll ask is, if there's an opportunity that we're looking at, how do we uniquely add value? Um, in the revolutionizing philanthropy, I think one of the things that um, sort of drove me a little bit crazy when we got into philanthropy. I remember telling my mom I was, we were going to create this family foundation and I was going to be CEO. And so I said, you know, I'm just going to move full time into philanthropy now, mom. And she said, what's that? She didn't know what philanthropy was. Philanthropy is a big, complicated word. We all know it in this room because this is a very sophisticated room. But again, if we went out and walked some neighborhoods around here, I bet we could find some people who say, what's philanthropy? Actually, the definition of philanthropy is the love of humanity. That's what philanthropy is. And so what we had seen is too often there were models of you work, 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 you make all your money, then about the time you're thinking about retiring, you take that money, you throw it over the wall, and you put it out to good. That just is a crazy model. There's nothing wrong with that. We'll celebrate anybody who wants to embrace that model, but we're leaving all kinds of things on the table if we settle for that. The revolutionizing philanthropy is really calling on everyone to be a philanthropist, no matter your age, no matter your stage. You have something you can give. You can have an action or resources that you bring to the table. And I think we've really been you know, strong believers in this really since you know, we created AOL. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the same kind of roots are there. Um, so our work in revolutionizing philanthropy has really been about that, trying to bring new people to the table. We've been very focused on what we call micro-donation giving. Arthur and I were talking earlier, there are three platforms we invested in very early, technology platforms. Um, we put, uh, in a hybrid kind of way, some of them nonprofits, some of them for-profits, between four and five million dollars of investment in them. And to date, they've yielded almost two billion dollars in micro donations from citizens all over the country. We feel pretty good about that return on investment, and we think that is absolutely the strike zone we want to be in. Because again, what did, it, what did it do? It democratized philanthropy. It brought people in many cases, because we've done the research on who has given through these, it brought them from good intentions to, oh my gosh, now I'll put my $10 in the bucket. Or now I'll you know, give $20 to this cause that I've just heard about on a digital platform. So it's exciting stuff. And I just think there's an opportunity, really, for all of us to own and claim that we're philanthropists. And it doesn't mean you're a rich person writing checks. It means that you're an activist. And you know, in my Twitter profile, all I say about myself is that I'm a social activist. And I just think if we could move the world and many, many citizens to see themselves as social activists and leave it up to them, the causes, the things they want to get behind and support, um, we'd have a healthier world. Mm. Social activist, or you know, you might say that you're a community organizer. Yeah, <laughs> even I'd accept that proudly. <laughs> That's uh, um, so. There's an interesting twist on this that I think that people are probably picking up on right now. You put four or five million dollars into micro giving platforms, and now people are giving billions of dollars away. It sounds to me like you care more about it for the good that it's doing to the givers than anything else. Is that right? Are you, are you really on the supply side of philanthropy? And Absolutely. Creating? So when social media came onto the scene very early, and I don't know if, if you guys remember this or not, but when Facebook first started, the adults couldn't be on it, right? And then 
Facebook switched or turned to switch, which our kids, I think, you know, still to this day go, oh, why did that happen? When they allowed them, the adults, to come on Facebook. <laughs> but Facebook was, you know, early, and then Twitter, of course, now it's several years ago when Twitter got started. But before there were large numbers on Facebook, because of our comfort with technology, our background, our interest in democratizing philanthropy, we started really playing around, if you will, doing some pilots on, wow, could it possibly be that we could leverage these new platforms for good right out of the chute? The technology world I had grown up in professionally, huh, if they were going to do something for good, it was when they had exhausted all their other market and revenue opportunities. Oh, OK, and then maybe there's something there at the nonprofit level we should think about. But with social media, it was very different. So we set about uh, running some experiments around this sort of micro donation and democratizing, um, and then publishing the results of our experiments. And it was really, really exciting work. Well, when we first did it, we trained nonprofits. We had 250 nonprofit partners, and we said, get ready. A campaign is coming in which we're going to use an online platform, and we're going to let people decide what things they want to give to. So we trained them on social media. And then, of course, we went out to the masses with partners, Facebook Causes and Parade Magazine, which is, wasn't exactly known to be the super techie crowd, okay? but we did that on purpose. And we said, now have at it. Come in and decide what causes you want. And we asked citizens to be on there championing the causes that they cared about. Well, when you look back at that, you say, well, who are you really working for? And I'll tell you what that really was about. It was a Trojan horse strategy to get the nonprofit sector ready for social media. We saw this wave coming. We had lived through one digital divide. We were quite concerned that if nonprofit organizations didn't understand the transformative nature of these new technologies that were coming along, they could get lost. They could lose big time. So we trained hundreds and hundreds of nonprofits in how to use uh, new digital platforms to both raise money, build advocacy, grow great com communities of support. We feel really good about that work today. That's terrific. That's, uh, it's, uh, it's really inspiring, as a matter of fact. Um, and you've thought an awful lot about what a new kind of vision in giving is supposed to be. As a matter of fact, you have an expression that you've been using of recent, in recent times. And you're running a campaign right now called Be Fearless. Be Fearless. Now, most people will say, I'm not afraid to give. But the truth is, People are afraid to give. And the more high profile you are, the more fear you find. I've worked with a lot of major philanthropists, and particularly in corporate philanthropy today, where people are afraid to do anything that takes any particular point of view that might actually look like uh, a philanthropic investment that's not successful. Boy, oh boy, do I see a lot of fear. So tell me about being fearless, what it means to you, and sure. how you're trying to engender a lack of fear. Sure. Well, it <clears throat> sounds like just a cool little name, doesn't it? But it's actually. A little more serious than that. Um, a few years ago at the anniversary of the foundation, the 15th anniversary, we started looking around and asking some big questions about what difference we thought we might have made in moving the needle on things. But more importantly, where has philanthropy more broadly gone in terms of creating a better world? And quite honestly, it wasn't a super pretty picture, because a lot of the problems that have been dogging us forever are still dogging us today. But there have been some really great breakthroughs and some you know, transformative movements, if you will, where things have really changed. And so we said, we want to go to school on those things. Why do some things break out and you know, really see change and a difference, and some things just stay the same? In some cases, hundreds of years. In some cases, billions, if not trillions of dollars chasing it. And so we hired a firm to basically do some work. And it became clear that there were some principles present wherever there was breakthrough or transformative change. And there are principles like make big bets and make history. You know, it's not a surprise to me because one of the things that we've discovered in the near 20 years of doing this is people like big ideas. They galvanize around big ideas. Big ideas are something that can bring new people you know, to the table versus incremental Change. Give me an example. Uh, eradica eradicating malaria uh -huh. big from idea. the planet. And so it's this is really big ideas, not just in, it's the same kind of big ideas that transform the American economy. Right. Where 
it's not entrepreneurship around a product that people know that they want. It's something they don't even know they want yet. Correct. It's a latent demand out there somehow. And you want to instantiate that in the philanthropic sector for something huge like that. Right. And in my experience, this made sense to me because I, we had been involved in a number of different initiatives that were big ideas. And when you hit on them, okay, people coalesce. It's quite amazing. And in the case of malaria, we are well on our way. Now, the reason I like to talk about malaria is malaria has been with us for a millennium. Okay, this is not a new problem on planet Earth. And there have been tons of people working on it, brilliant people, tons of money thrown at the problem by private sector, by public sector. But what had really never happened was somebody stepping back and saying, you know, what's a really big idea? Let's get rid of it for once and for all time, but not stopping there. This goes to another principle, building a really big collaboration to get that done. Because big ideas are not going to be addressed by individual organizations or one person. They can lead and champion them and play a very important role, but single-handedly we don't see breakthrough because of one individual. There's almost always a collaborative at work. That principle in our Be Fearless work is called Reach Beyond Your Bubble, and I'll talk about it a little bit more. But the, when I talk about the malaria example, particularly, so let's say you were in South Africa or Mozambique, or, um, and you were talking to someone working on the malaria problem. Before, you might say, well, what are you doing? And she might say, well, I make bed nets. You know, because people need to sleep under bed nets to <coughs> eradicate malaria. If you go back to that person today, she'll say, I'm helping to eradicate malaria. It really is a big idea in which you really sort of circle the wagons. Everyone understands their role, but their role ultimately is to the ends. They're not focused on the means or the part of the role that they're playing, but sort of the big idea, the big dream out there. And I think it just changes how people, the passion people bring to what they do, no matter where they work in that system, small roles, roles big roles, um, and it makes total sense to us. Why are people fearful to do that? Is it because in the same way that starting a company is scary, that putting all your money on one horse is scary? Is, is, is that what it comes down to? So, you know, let's talk a little bit about sort of the other side of Be Fearless. I mean, the reason we thought the campaign was needed was obviously if we have the same old problems dogging us, what do we need? We need innovation. Well, how do you get innovation? Guess what? You have to take risk. That's where we run into trouble. Mm. It's exactly what you just said, Arthur. And it turns out, actually, the more you have to lose, the less likely you are to want to risk that, right? So think about big established foundations for a minute. That was someone else's money. That's someone else's reputation that now you're put in charge of protecting and guarding. And here I can really understand this. So my husband and I are what they call living donors. It's our money, we call the shots. It's pretty easy to sort of, you know, take risks, do what we want to do. So if you, if I had $1,000 of my own money, I might be really risky with that. I'll try something crazy to see if we could find an innovation. But if you give me your $1,000, I'm suddenly going to get a little cautious, a little protective, and I'm going to be a little less willing to take risks. So the Be Fearless campaign really recognizes that there are a bunch of sectors out there, big philanthropy, you know, old, established sort of reputations that we're protecting, the public sector. Why? because it's not their money either, it's taxpayers' money, and they're scared to death about making any mistakes or taking risks with taxpayers' money, and nonprofit organizations. They rely on grants, and the last thing they want to do is do something that looks like a screw-up, right? Because they're afraid the grants are going to dry up. So the Be Fearless campaign really calls us back to, can we start by agreeing that the same old, same old isn't good enough anymore? We need new ways to solve old problems, so we need innovation. Can we agree it's hard to innovate if you're not taking risks? And then the third piece is, when you're taking risks, you have to acknowledge that failure is an option. Boy, that piece is tough. That's really, really tough. People don't want to talk about failure, but in, at least in these sectors. But you know what? Talk to an entrepreneur who's built a great company. Go out to Silicon Valley. Valley. They celebrate failure because they understand fundamentally that there's no progress without failure somewhere. Think about your own life. 
I don't know about you, but pretty much all of the great opportunities and growth areas for me came out of not a success, but a failure that I had to pick up and do something with. And time and time again, some of the great breakthroughs we've seen in businesses we've invested in or that we've had ourselves, the great stuff comes not from the comfort zone. It comes from risk taking. And of course, you don't, we don't like failure. We don't really want to celebrate failure in that you know, no one likes to lose or fail. It's just a recognition that you can't have innovation without accepting that failure may be an option. If you fail, fail fast, fail forward, pick up, and either you or someone who comes behind you should be a little further along life's path because of those failures. Hmm. You know, Thomas Edison said, I'm a better sponge than inventor. And what he meant by that was there had been patents in the light bulb for decades before Edison started working on it. He was just smart enough to understand all the failed attempts so that when he came along, he looks brilliant, doesn't he? Because he figured it out. But he was the first to say, I didn't. I benefited from understanding all the failures that went before me so I could then perfect it and mm. build something new. So I, to, be, to be more specific, I've got two questions. Uh, number one is, what is your most fearless investment, number one? And number two, what is your biggest failure and what did you learn from it? So first of all, right now, I mean, we talked about malaria, but what's your most fearless investment right now? Yeah, so. Tell me something scary. Yeah, <laughs> scary. <laughs> yeah, it was a little scary times. Um, so I um, co-chaired something called uh, the U.S.-Palestinian Partnership. And one of my co-chairs, and that was Walter Isaacson from um, Aspen. Um, and there, what was happening was, several years ago, as it became clear that the peace process politically was stalled in the Middle East, the question came up, well, where might we make some progress? There's a strongly held belief, which this is part of my belief system, that if you condition an environment for peace, it could then be helpful in the long run to build a political process. What do we mean by that? If you'd gone into the West Bank years ago, and even if you hadn't, you saw in the news, young Palestinians were going into Israel, blowing themselves up, and Israelis as well. If you went into the West Bank, you saw a situation where there was literally no hope and opportunity. So suddenly, no justification here for their actions, I want to make clear, but suddenly you begin to see, hmm, strapping on the bomb might be a different decision for a young person if they think there's no other way that they can move forward in life. So can we condition the environment for peace by bringing some economic opportunity into the West Bank? So we were appointed into these roles with the, in the interest of bringing U.S. private sector resources to the West Bank. And uh, we did some really important work there, including setting up a venture capital fund, which has just started making its first investments all in uh, IT companies in the West Bank. We put a mortgage facility, so for the first time, people could actually get a mortgage on a house. We put a medium-sized business loan facility in place so that if you had three taxis and you wanted to grow that to 10 because your business was, there was a, a way forward, a path to capital for that. We put youth centers so that youth had the opportunity where there is digital divide to go and have access to things in the world that they previously didn't have access to. Entrepreneurial training, Google came over, trained young women on how to build new businesses using free Google apps. We certified engineers through Google. Cisco came trained as well. So there was a variety of activities. And I must say, things have been you know, pleasantly quiet uh, in recent years. And a lot of the activity that really sort of led to this work has, for the most part, diminished. Now, we did see some flare-ups a few months ago, but for the most part, things have remained pretty quiet. And if you go to the West Bank, it's actually thriving. You would not believe the number of English-speaking engineers in the West Bank. It's not the picture that you see in the news every night. And these people are filled with hope and promise now in many cases. There's an entrepreneurial spirit that's taken hold, pathways for some of these entrepreneurs to build companies, and it's pretty exciting work. But it was fearless. So. Fearless means, I mean, it was scary. And scary means that you could have taken attacks. You, I mean, I don't mean physical attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about. Well, we could have. Going yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could have taken all sorts of attacks. But so, so tell me your scariest moments and when bad things happened. When you had to, to be, you don't have to be fearless if there's no threat. 
So, yeah. so what are the threats? I mean, was there criticism? Was there outrage? Was sure. there well, op-eds in the Washington Post? You could imagine yeah. that even, even starting out when you're talking about building economic opportunity for the Palestinians, there are folks that sit on the other side of that argument. Like in a world of precious resources, why would you spend them that way, right? I will say Israel was an important partner with us in this. So although it's called the U.S.-Palestinian partnership, Israel was at the table and a big part of our strategy as we went forward. But I think it was fraught with risk, to be honest with you. There wasn't sort of civil society in place in uh, the West Bank. There weren't a lot of the conditions that one normally works within when you try to take big initiatives forward. Um, so I would say, as we sat down and looked at it, there was probably a greater chance of failure than success in what we did. But where we sit today, and we need years to figure this out, so it's way too early to say, okay, you know, job done, mission accomplished. But where we sit today, we feel really good about the indicators that that work has had a very, very positive effect on the citizens in the West Bank. Hmm. And I think unambiguously, in, in from what certainly what we, we know about your investment and, and how you describe it, that's a success. Tell me about a failure. Sure. Tell me about your worst day running the foundation. Yeah, I remember it well, actually. <laughs> remember I said I don't like to talk about failure, <laughs> but I have to. Um, and actually the story is really a good one because it, it, it played a role in our Be Fearless campaign as well. Um, so we had a clean water initiative focused on Sub-Saharan Africa, 10 countries. We launched it at the Clinton Global Initiative with President Clinton to my left and Laura Bush to my right. A huge collaboration that didn't only involve sort of U.S. public resources, but a lot of foundations coming together, a lot of philanthropies coming together, NGOs supporting it, et cetera. Um, and the idea was to build these clean water interventions in villages around sub-Saharan Africa. So we launched it. We got it funded in a very significant way. We had a very clear business plan. We relied very much on partners on the ground in Africa to take it forward. And it became clear soon after, I'd say within maybe after the first year, that things were falling apart. Hmm. And uh, we were, you know, obviously quite upset to learn this was happening, but you know, what were we going to do? So we began to have a series of meetings with our partners, amongst ourselves, et cetera, basically saying, okay, what are we going to do? This thing is not working. This thing is really not working. We have some issues here. And so we spent about maybe a year trying to course correct it, putting different interventions in place to try to right the ship, if you will, and the ship was not riding. <laughs> So it really came to a point where we had to decide, all right, we're at a point now, we either have to disclose, we have to shut it down, we have to quietly go away, we have to pick a path because this thing is failing. And so, you know, it was uncomfortable. You can probably feel that even as I talk about it right now. So we did have a conversation, but couldn't we just sweep it under the rug? And maybe nobody will ask us what happened to that gigantic water <laughs> initiative you launched at the at CGI. Um, but we always knew that wasn't going to be the way we were handling it. And so I said, all right, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to come very clean on it in a very public way. I'm going to write a blog, and I'm going to acknowledge it didn't work, it hasn't worked, and we have to declare failure. So I did that. And I would say within hours, if not days, it became clear that it would be the most widely shared written piece I'd ever written. And I'd been writing for a really long time in a lot of different formats and you know, brands and different things like that. And what became clear, I started getting calls from some of my peers saying, wow, like, you just like owned up to that. I'm like, I know, I can't believe I did it. Um, <laughs> But they were like, we need more of that. Is that failing forward, by the way? Is that what you mean by failing uh, forward? I'll explain. We did fail yeah. forward. I, I, I would never leave this story with just it was a failure and I'm embarrassed by it because that's not how the story ends. So what happened is it became clear there was an appetite in our sector for talking about failure. Uh. And that was probably the seeds of what made us interested in the Be Fearless campaign because it became very clear that people weren't talking about failures. So then we started hosting what we call fail fests at different things we went to. 
And I must tell you, if you have beer or wine, people are a lot more willing to talk about their failures. It's helpful, yeah. We try to do it around a cocktail hour. <laughs> um, and you know, it's not really to be, oh, ha, 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 we failed. It really is this idea that if we were all a little more honest about, you know what, we're all trying to change the world here, and guess what? We don't get it right 100% of the time. Big shocker, right? But we can learn from each other if we're really willing to stand up and say, we tried this and it just didn't work. So now we really make a point of talking about that in anything we undertake. We made a commitment that every time we publish, we will publish what we learned and what we didn't get right. And we have many partners in this um, as well. The failing forward is that ultimately we pivoted. We're still in clean water. We still are passionately focused on bringing clean water to people in Africa. And we have a number of different partnerships and collaborations around that work. But we just had to take a different tact that assured sort of better um, execution on the ground, if you will, um, and with other partners that we could have a better sense of sort of um, assurance that things were going right. So you were clear about what you learned. You were specific about it, and you shared it with uh, you shared it with the public, and you shared it with your partners, right. such that everybody could f get a little bit of benefit from your failing forward. Yes, that was our hope. Um, and you know, I do. Rem you just said what well, was my worst aid foundation. I often tease about it, but I, I literally remember like you know. Looking at the screen, I had to hit send, I had to hit send, I didn't want to hit send, but hitting the send really mm. was. It was a really big moment where, um, and because I said earlier, the further you are along in life, and I'm sure many of you feel this way, the more you have, the more you've achieved, the higher the profile, the harder it is really to first take the risk and then acknowledge when it doesn't go right. You know, it's just too easy to fear what are they going to say. and. So we just had to get over that. We just had to get over that. And now we boldly claim that we're about innovation. And so as part of the business planning that we do at the Case Foundation, my team knows when they build business plans, we want to end a year or two out with what we call some red lights, at least 10 or 20% of things that aren't thumbs up. Because if we're not doing that, we're really not out on the edge of innovation. We're kidding ourselves. We're not trying hard enough if 100% of the stuff we try, oh yeah, it's all good, everything's going swimmingly. It just doesn't work that way. Hmm. It certainly doesn't work that way in the non-profit, uh, the for-profit sector, and so expecting that it would in the nonprofit sector is unrealistic. Uh, there's a, a, a line of literature that suggests that the reason that the, that the public sector is so uninnovative ordinarily is because what we think of as trying things in the for-profit sector is called waste, fraud, and abuse when you get into government, and the nonprofit is somewhere in the middle. So That's trying to right. sort that out, particularly at the level of big bets that can come from relatively elite philanthropy, can set a, an example for others. And, and this is what I want to get into next is the example for others. Uh, and this is my last area, so start thinking about what you want to ask, Gene, because I'm going to turn to you next. Um, you talked a little bit about micro-giving, micro-giving sites, so you can democratize philanthropy a little bit more. And, and let's talk about democratizing philanthropy. One of the key themes that keeps coming through in, in virtually all in this whole exchange so far for the past 45 minutes is that you care about philanthropy because philanthropy is a good thing for givers. So giving to giving for givers is kind of what's going on here a lot. You want more people <laughs> to be able to give. It's obviously yeah. transformed your life. Yes. It's a big part of who you are. Yes. And you think it's going to be good for me in my life, and so you want me to be doing more of it. And actually what you really care about is our kids. Yeah. doing that and kids who are not growing up in circumstances that are economically favorable. So tell me more about that. Why do you care about that so much and how are you democratizing philanthropy? Well, I describe sort of some of these things that we're doing in terms of investing in new platforms and pilots that we continue to run. But, you know, we're just, we continue to look for opportunities to grow the space. And I want to say, Arthur and I had a conversation before we came on stage. You know, at one level, we're super jazzed by new ideas around democratizing philanthropy and especially using the empowering nature of technology. But the reality is, giving is stuck at 2% of GDP. It has been forever. Despite these billions of new dollars coming in, all these, 
it's not really creating a bigger pie. And this is something that I was explaining to Arthur. We're working uh, with Indiana University to really try to understand better. How can all this great new activity be going on, but the pie itself isn't growing? And absolute numbers, of course, are, but the pie itself is not growing. And I think we are, um, we remain kind of tirelessly focused on what can we do to, to move the bigger needle. Um, and that's you know a big part of what's driving what we want to do here. How did it transform your life in a way that you want to share? How is your life tangibly better, given the fact that you're spending all of your time on philanthropy? And how do you want to pass on that particular value? Yeah. So um, when I chaired the President's Council, uh, we used to say, and it was a very interesting data point for me, which is going to seem like a duh thing, OK? The number one reason people volunteer, because they're asked. And you go, huh, that's interesting. Of course. But it turns out, actually, the power of the ask is a really, really big deal. And I would say, even before you get to ask, the power of demonstration is equally as strong. And in giving, this is where some of the new technologies can allow us to talk proactively about things we care about, things we support, things that we give to. My background in marketing, OK, we called that word of mouth marketing. And technology represents an opportunity for all of us to share with each other you know, things we care about, things we're passionate about. Not to say, oh, will you write this $10 check? Merely to put out there, this is what I'm doing. And this idea, your question is, you know, this idea of the power of the ask or even the power of demonstration is really, really remarkable. And I think I benefited because somebody responded to an opportunity that they saw maybe to improve the life of someone else. And I'm deeply passionate about spending my career and my time trying to set the conditions so there's more and more and more of that every day in new ways. And that really is behind our revolutionizing philanthropy work. Hmm. Uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the millennials and what philanthropy is going to look like? Thousand percent optimistic. I believe they are the next greatest generation. We uh, sponsor the largest millennial gathering every year called MCON. And if you don't know about it, you should check it out. And there we have conversations with millennial leaders around all the topics we just discussed in this last 45 minutes. Their giving is unbelievable. When you see them looking at their phones like this and you get frustrated, you need to know that 80% of them have used their cell phones to, to connect with a nonprofit organization. You need to know that their level of giving is unbelievable, that the passion that they're bringing to civic engagement, I just haven't seen engagement like this in a long, long time. So I'm very, very um, enthusiastic about them, and I spend a tremendous amount of time with millennials. Mm, terrific. Uh, there's hope for the world after what we in the baby boom have done to it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to turn to you now. Who's up first? Uh, we've got a few minutes, actually plenty of time to get to your questions here. We'll go to the front row here, and then we'll go over here. My name is Lian. Thanks for your presentation. And Thank you. I think when you success if, uh, to be a philanthropist, uh, you are really success. You have fortune already, right? And you have established your yes. career. And I just wonder, in this world, if people face some problem, how do you deal with that? How do you help them? How do you help the world to become a better? world, better planet. So the problem now is very familiar is you mentioned uh, you have a PPP, you have a deal with uh, cooperate with the government and big corporations. The problem is all those in the daily life people face, in, especially in the internet, they face the abuse, the hacking, and uh, actually a lot of people not because they are lack of productivity or skill, but because of some people harass and uh, victimize them. So I just wonder if you can help these type of things. I know fearless can do a lot better than that. But the problem is that they deal with something sort of smaller scale, and while the big loser, the general public, they are ignored. So I just wonder if we can really take some leadership to 
this is uh, a very important and urgent task that we have to deal with. Yes, I agree. And you hit on a couple of different themes, so let me just hopefully address the questions I think you were asking. There's no question that technology has both a promise, right, and a risk to us. And that many people, that there are abuses of these new digital platforms. In the way, by the way, there's been abuses of every new technology that's ever come along, right? You think about it, the telephone, if you think about it, the video recorder, people quickly, there was a race to the bottom there too. So I think we'll always see that as new technologies come along. But our work in igniting civic engagement really calls on each one of us to play a role in our communities to lift up the other. And I think I said earlier in the talk, you know, if, if we could actually get real traction on that, it could be remarkable. It would mean that as people are abused, whether they're abused in the real world or whether they're abused in the virtual world, there's someone that's standing up for them or acting on their behalf or jumping in. That's what civic engagement is really meant to be about, right? And remember I said that philanthropy is the love of humanity. And that can play out in a lot of different ways through action as well as through money. And I think that really is the answer. And if I haven't made it clear, what we've really been passionately focused on at the Case Foundation is just that, is trying to bring people from not sitting on the sidelines, you know, but having everyone play a role so that those who are without opportunity have a path to opportunity. Hmm. There's been a market incentive to do bad things, certainly on the internet yes, and other forms of technology. And, the, and one of the interesting lines of philanthropy is to create market incentives to do good things. One of the things that I've seen, for example, is uh, uh, a, a philanthropic competitions for the best way to create new software that will filter inappropriate content off the internet. There's a huge economic incentive to make sure that you can't filter inappropriate content. I mean, the idea of everybody can get over the wall, especially your teenage kids, there's a lot of money to be made in that. But to the extent that philanthropy can, can work with market incentives so right. that, that entrepreneurs and innovators will want to do the right thing is really an interesting line of inquiry. Right, and of course, that's a, another piece of what we're focused on. We didn't talk about impact investing, but this whole realm of unleashing entrepreneurship, we do, we are excited, and again, some of it touches this new generation, but it doesn't have to be this new generation. We are excited about these new companies that are coming along, a new class of companies focused on addressing social challenges. Some call them social enterprises. Um, but at the end of the day, when you think about it, a lot of areas that touch us as individuals or people in our communities, education, energy, transportation, healthcare, they've largely been undisrupted by new technologies. And what we're seeing is a whole new class of young entrepreneurs coming onto the scene building companies that can bring solutions to citizens in meaningful ways. And we're very excited by it. And we didn't get into impact investing, but it's a really exciting new area that allows this new class of investors, some of them philanthropists, some of them not, to back these companies as another way to come at social challenges, building a new marketplace. Yeah, the low-tech way, as a father of teenage boys, is to lock them in their rooms with no computers. <laughs> <laughs> um, right over here. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Brad Sweet. I'm with a technology firm that we think is fearlessly trying to build a civic engagement platform. Some days it feels foolhardy. Uh, and one of the things that's really opened our eyes in the last couple of weeks is we've been doing, digging into the body of research about what mobilizes people, what incentivizes people to engage mm -hmm. either in their civic, their community right. setting, is the specificity that they are looking for in detail and how will I be participating? What or will I be doing? And there's really a barrier that we're learning from the research, from working with Red Cross, from working with a lot of groups that try to reach out to mass mobilization for a good cause when people say, well, I don't know what you are asking me to do. It's, you know, if you're asking me for $10, sometimes yes, but mm -hmm. what will my $10 go toward? Mm -hmm. Or if you want me to show up on Saturday, what will I be doing? Right. And so it's, it's really changed our way of looking at the problem. Uh, and one of the key data points that echoed with us was most nonprofits think that they get about three touches on their website when somebody navigates to their website. To, and so you have to kind of be superficial and fast and visual. And the data actually doesn't back that up at all. The data backs up the fact that people will look up to 100 times on a website to really educate themselves about what your program is doing, what are your results, before they make an investment, before they make a donation, before they volunteer. 
So how can the nonprofit sector kind of take advantage of this, this dawning realization that people do care to educate themselves? You know, they, they will take advantage of their 24-7 connectivity to get smarter, and they're very um, differentiating about which causes they do support based on the information that those causes make available to them and the specificity about how they're going to be able to engage. Yeah, I think we need to shine more of a light on that data. Um, I tend to do it certainly once a year, but I try to do more than that. When we're coming up on MCON, we usually have a full press day in which, we're, and this is largely millennial driven, but in which we're sharing data like that. And we're also, this partnership that we have with these hundreds of nonprofits, we are routinely sending things out to them about data like that. And I would actually love to connect with you after and see if you've written on it or if you have data that we then can pass on to our partners or even write about on our Case Foundation site. You know, we have about a half a million Twitter followers, so we really do try to use it as a megaphone and a spotlight for new and interesting things that can help the sector. So, would love to connect after. Hmm. Armin Choksi. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in the issue you talked about, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Water, mm -hmm. water Initiative. Mm -hmm. I would think about that as the last mile problem. It's very difficult to get good services mm -hmm. down to, a, to that level. Uh, I'm involved in an operation which is a for-profit operation addressing last mile issues. And I was wondering what is your idea about changing the paradigm that instead of having non-profits go to yes. address that last mile problem, Having four profits. Having four profits to it because the whole incentive structure, yeah. the organization, you talked about execution. Yes. I've been involved with nonprofits and with the public sector. Execution is a disaster yeah. in many cases. How do you sure. believe that the for profit sector could address that issue? Yeah, it's huge. So it was Melinda Gates, right, who was at the last mile trying to figure out how do we get vaccines out to these people in the middle of nowhere. And she turns around and she sees a Coke bottle. Well, if they can get Coke here, how is it we can't get our vaccines here? So what happened? A beautiful partnership with Coca-Cola to train people on the ground about the last mile distribution. And Coke is still deeply involved in that work, both with HIV and in, in other areas of disease as well. There is a huge potential to tap, and even in Hurricane Katrina, how the first responders at scale that really made a difference were private sector companies like Walmart, who had you know, unbelievable systems and you know, clear measurement and discipline around how you get from point A to point B. So there's a huge opportunity to more um, fundamentally integrate the work of the private sector into the delivery of human services, and particularly this last mile. So would be happy to connect with you after and find out more about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> right here, and then we'll go to the back. Uh, yes, um, my name's Martin Worcester. Since you mentioned the Giving Pledge, I'm curious, does your foundation have a term limit or is it designed to be set up in perpetuity? And what led you to make the decision one way or the other? Yeah. So long before the Giving Pledge came along, and we're deeply grateful to Warren and to Bill and Melinda for what they've done, um, we had made it clear that we intended to give the majority of our wealth away in our lifetime. Um, we never intended for our foundation to be in perpetuity, but we haven't finished the sentence of, okay, so then how long? We're not really sure. Um, but what we do know is that uh, it will not survive us, and uh, we don't intend for it to be in perpetuity. Hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that, how you advise people? I mean, when we find some people believe that between now and 2050, we're going to see $40 trillion in wealth being right. basically broken free from the, from the, the lives of the those who generated it as they pass away. And that's going to mean a lot of donations or bequests or inheritances. Yeah. And how are you talking to your peers about this? Well, to be honest with you, there's sort of two different conversations. One is we are focused on the wealth transfer. It's very, very exciting. I do want to harken back just for a minute to impact investing because I think many of those who will be the recipients of that wealth want new ways to solve old problems. 
they've looked at the same old ways of doing things and they see there hasn't necessarily been efficacy there. So, you know, I can't see around all corners, but I suspect that 20, 30, 40 years out, the way we're going to be addressing social challenges is not just your classic it's government's job, it's nonprofit's job. I think we're going to see companies and all kinds of hybrid organizations begin to emerge that brings together public and private sector in meaningful ways. The second piece I want to say is, look, if you really want to move the needle, move the public sector spending needle. And it's a big, important reason to engage them if you're involved in philanthropy or nonprofit work. Because if you can move them just a little bit, it immediately dwarfs any amount of philanthropic effort taking place. You had Bill here, Bill Gates. You know, Bill likes to say, you know, I think the Gates Foundation doesn't spend in one year what uh, the Department of Education spends in a day or a week. I mean, we think they're really huge. They're nothing compared to the level of public spending trying to stay focused on making a better world. If we can move that a little bit, we should, and if you're here and you're an influencer and you're engaged in different things, make sure you bring the public sector to the table, whether that's local, whether that's regional, whether that's federal or global, because if we can influence that world, that's really powerful. Hmm. A case study on that, by the way, is that after Hurricane Katrina, the private donations, which outpaced even the private donations after 9-11, it was huge, the outpouring of support after, after Hurricane Katrina, amounted to 3% of the rebuilding need in Mississippi and in Louisiana. The other 97% that was public sector uh, support, however, followed the nonprofit support. The nonprofits were the pioneers, the Lewis right. and Clarks, right. on, on what needed to get done. So that's right. a living example of exactly really the principle. Our, our power is outsized relative to the dollars. Yeah, if we right. only stay involved, exactly right. Uh, back here and back, yes, sir. Hey, my name's Sam Lane. I'm actually part of the Enterprise Club in Austin, Texas. And Great. Walking by. Love Austin. Yeah. Love Austin. Came from too. South by. Yeah. Woohoo! All right. Yeah. So um, Enterprise Club is AEI's club uh, for under 40, which is a lot under 40. All right. Yeah. Great. So I'm a yeah. part of those millennials. That yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Computers. But um, so my question is, I actually started a social giving tech company called Pyrex, turned into rally.org. A lot of politicians use it. And then I started my own private equity firm. But the reason why I got involved in AI was because I kind of started in the bottom 3% of economic society, and I'm not there anymore. And so <laughs> it's brought a different problem in my life, which is you know, growing up in a trailer in the sticks, you don't, you're not really around many people who actually give. And right. so what I'm finding now is that kind of in the millennial generation, and I hear my story repeated fairly often, particularly with technology, because you know, you're 22, you can do pretty incredible things, is that how, how would you kind of, what advice would you offer when people kind of start getting involved at a younger age in philanthropy? Like, how do you pick it? How right. do you choose it? Right. What do you stay involved in? Right. And you know, could you kind of help provide some insight into kind of what your experience was in that? Sure, very... sure. And I will say my experience, you know, kind of from the other side might have been a little bit different than yours because I saw giving all around me. It just wasn't traditional philanthropy. It was, I don't have the extra 50 for the rent payment this month. Can I borrow it? Hmm. And I'll, you know, and that kind of giving, I think, played a role for me as much as anything I saw that was more traditional philanthropy. Um, but to your question, you know, I spend a lot of time with students, particularly in business schools, and I think it's important to ask yourself, what do you love? What are you passionate about? And what are you good at? And I think if you get a frame around those three questions, that should begin to inform where you should start to try stuff as you move into philanthropy. Because the fact of the matter is, if you're going to you know, create a business, you should ask those three questions. But where people are usually excellent is when they found that place where they're passionate and there's a great need. And so I would say to you, you know, literally, and, and I'm all about intentionality, so I also encourage people to write it out, right? Like get a notebook and start, really start asking some questions around those lines. And I think things will start to become clear to you. Now, I don't want to be a hypocrite sitting here because I think I didn't do a good job of that when we started the Case Foundation. So it's from having learned the benefit of doing it or 
the benefit of doing it wrong. No, having learned, having done it not so right at first. Um, if I had just understood, oh, really, the same things that I actually loved and that I was good at in business might be the greatest contribution I can make in philanthropy? Ha, huh, who knew? It took me about three years to figure that out. I thought I had to be something I wasn't. I thought I had to adapt somehow or talk differently. <laughs> um, but you don't. Whoever you are that's led to your success is probably going to be the, the best thing you can bring to philanthropy. So it's not a crisp answer for you, but that's what I would encourage you to do. Three years is not that long. Well done. Uh, back here in the back, and then we'll go uh, to Bob Hershey. Bernardo Rico, IFC, the World Bank. And this is kind of more of a future personal question for myself on something that I'm thinking about creating. What if you have an issue that sits right of center, politically speaking, but you want to kind of transcend that in terms of raising money that's nonpartisan going forward? I'm, I'm, I would love to share the idea right now, but I'm just not ready um, at the point. But in thinking about donor funding, um, in thinking about perhaps where one might be politically and, and an idea that is arguably right of center, but actually I don't view it that way and I'm trying to shift the model in terms of how people think that way. How, what, what kind of advice would you provide to someone like that yeah. in terms of ra raising money on a nonpartisan basis? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everything we've done has been nonpartisan and specifically bipartisan and policy is a big part of what we pay attention to for the reasons we just discussed around you know the important role of public sector but i would say to you i think perhaps the fastest path to support might be to not start with the political but obviously you're onto something that you think has an end and maybe that end is a big idea like i talked about earlier and i've just seen donors organizations passion coalesce around big ideas. So I would just say, really put the emphasis on what you're trying to do, not on how you're going to get there, which some people might read as right or left, but more you know, where you intend to end up. And if you can build some enthusiasm around that, it might depoliticize the situation. Hard for me to comment without knowing specifically what you're talking about, but you know, that's what I would suggest. The other thing I wanted to add to the last question, which touches on yours just a little bit, you know, remember I talked about the model of philanthropy is sort of when you're older, you know, you throw it over the wall. One of the greatest assets you can bring to philanthropy, no matter who you are in this room or anybody watching, is your network. And so one of the reasons we think it's critical for people to get engaged in this work early in their lives is because that's when your network is most active. You know, it's really when you have people you know who are doing meaningful things, companies you deal with, it's when you're really in the mix that you can add so much additional value beyond any checks that you write. And you know, some of our grantees will secretly, they would never want us to say publicly they told us that, but have secretly said it's that element that we bring to the table that they find even more valuable than the checks we write. So don't underestimate you know, how, how far you can get with your new initiative or with what you know, you're thinking about just in terms of activating your network and starting to, to bring people, uh, you know, connect them to meaningful things. Hmm. Last question today uh, is going to go to Bob Hershey, and we're going to be out of time because Gene's going to have to leave at 1.30, which is what we promised, and some of you have jobs too. So, <laughs> we'll see Bob. But, so Bob Hershey, last question. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Hi, in Bob. getting together your multiple donors, uh, how do you get them to meet online and get an economic consensus of what they're going to do, yeah. how much each contributes. OK. So in some of our early, um, it's changed through time, and it really varies by each sort of initiative we get into. But in our early social media trials, it was called um, uh, America's Giving Challenge. Um, and we did two of them. And we ended up getting about 400,000 people participating. Um, and about $4 million, actually $200,000 and $4 million um, is what we got. There we just put partners in place who are also part of that megaphone and spotlight that I talked about earlier. We do have the benefit of a big social media footprint and we tend to use that to sort of bring people to the flame, if you will. But in other cases where we have partners that are corporate entities or, you know, or public sector entities or whatever, Man, I'm telling you, if you get it right on the big idea, people are much more willing then to come in 
and then they're much more willing to be seen as part of a collaborative. It even goes back to that risk taking thing I talked about because you know if, if there's a risk or there's a big idea and people are going really, they're much more willing to take that risk if they have others standing on the stage with them, right? So they're not out there alone. So it's a combination of really using marketing and communication strategies to spotlight, but also having a strategy that will sort of draw moths to the flame. Hmm. Um, this has been a great discussion. Uh, the time has flown by. We've gone over an hour uh, at this point. And I want to make one more point before we, before we break off today. Uh, Dean reminded us what philanthropy means in Greek. It's the love for fellow man. And this is the best example of that, I think. Look, everything that Gene has talked about today is people-centric. It's not what you can say about everybody's giving. It's not what you can say about every single foundation. But if the point is the love of our fellow men and women, then philanthropy being brought to bear, whether it's in a public-private partnership, if it's being fearless, if it's failing forward to the extent that we need to fail, which in point of fact we do, once you focus on people, that is the essence of philanthropy. Now, what is the philosophy that we're hearing behind this? That people, whom we're trying to help, that we're trying to dignify, people are assets to develop. People are not liabilities to manage. This is an important distinction between old school philanthropy and the visionary philanthropy that we're talking about here today. Look, you're one kind of person or the, you're the other. Either you believe that poor people and vulnerable people are liabilities to manage, or you believe they're assets to develop. We've heard very distinctly today that every philanthropic activity coming forth from the Case Foundation and every idea that Gene has suggested to you is to look at all people like assets to develop. That's optimistic, that's unifying, that's forward-looking. I believe it's the best that can be thought and said in the philanthropic environment. Pushing freedom down, pushing opportunity down, sharing these ideas with what people, the people who need these things the most. These are the values that Gene Case brings to us today, that the Case Foundation espouses. And in point of fact, these are exactly the values upon which the American Enterprise Institute was founded in 1938 and for which we're warriors still today. So I want to thank you for coming and sharing this time. And most of all, I'd like to invite all of you to join me in thanking Gene Case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.